Hi, my name is Zach Dewhurst, and I am the Business Development Manager at Deco Network. I'm also the owner of Print Phase, a screen print and DTF heat transfer supply company. In all my years in the custom apparel decoration industry, I've seen a lot of changes. And since the pandemic a few years ago, one of the biggest ones is automating screen printing when it comes to the pre-press process. Anybody who's been a screen printer knows that everything that happens before you get onto press is probably the most important part of the decoration process. You can have the best piece of screen printing equipment, but if you don't develop your screens properly, you're going to battle it on press. So we're really excited today to have Greg from Saudi join us and talk about how to automate the pre-press screen printing process. Everything from coding screens to washing and developing the screens to reclaim. Uh, if it's done outside of the pre press or outside of the press, Saudi really is one of your experts when it comes to using the right chemicals and equipment, and they've been doing it for decades. But before we talk about um, how to automate the pre press screen printing process, we need to talk about our awesome sponsor, Deco Network, the all-in-one software solution for custom decoration apparel shops that allow you to automate and grow your business. Deco Network software includes both the front and back end solution so that you have the website capabilities to empower your customers to request quotes and place orders, but then you have the back end order management system to make everything flow flawlessly. Just like screen printing, you have the pre-press and the on-press, and you really need everybody in sync. And that's what makes Deco Network uh, different than the competition. It is the true all-in-one software platform to help you manage your custom decoration business. Now, with that said, let's get on to the show. How's it going, Greg? Good. How are you doing, Zach? Good. Uh, ready to talk screen printing with you and everyone's favorite part of the process, reclaim and coding and exposing. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Desirable. Yeah, it's the least desirable, but arguably the most important. Most important. It all starts there. I it mean, if you, in that it, it really does start and end. And, um, I have seen a trend over the past handful of years through touring shops. It's all about automating it because one, it's, it's the least favorite process uh, to have to do. So the more we can use equipment to automate it, the better. And uh, ever since like COVID and so forth, it's hard to find those employees, no matter where you put them in the shop. And because it's the least favorite, it has the most amount of turnover. And before you know it, you're just constantly spending time with training. Or now all of a sudden they're taking the power washer, going too close. They're hurting the mesh. I mean, before you know it, you're throwing money down the drain. Um, automation. So um, when I, you know, I, I go to pretty much every trade show, always stop by the Saudi booth. And uh, I see a lot of really cool automation equipment. Um, everything to, again, reclaim, to um, coating, to cleaning squeegees and flood bars. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's some of the exposure units that we now see and, and the different ways to develop the screen is really cool. So uh, real excited to talk with you. Um, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a Saudi guy. All my chemicals in my shop are Saudi. Um, highly recommend anybody listening to uh, check out Saudi's equipment and chemicals because they really are the best. And I get, I really feel you get what you pay for, uh, Greg. And um, again, we're, we're talking about screen printing. There's a lot of chemistry that goes into it and you have to respect it. Um, so let's start with coding. Um, to me, coding is one of the easiest things to do, you know, compared to reclaim and, and exposure. I mean, really, it is probably the easiest. But eh, when you're doing it manually, there's a lot of human error that could, you know, if I coded and you coded, we're going to have different thicknesses of emulsion. We're going to have different EOMs. And when you're going to expose the screens, that could create, I mean, there's just all types of things. So talk to us about yep. automating if coding. Spent, if you were watching hockey on Sunday, Sunday evening, 
and uh, had a few beers. Uh, Monday morning, you're not quite as good at coding as you are on Tuesday or Wednesday. No, no, and and that EOM is pretty important, obviously. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, especially with the new technologies, the computers to screen technologies, it's extremely critical that you have consistent EOM, uh, emulsion over the mesh. So um, the only way to get that is through automation. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, coding, with automatic coding, uh, it tends to be a little slower than manual um, coding. A guy can coat really fast with a, a manual coder and coat a lot of screens, um, but you just don't have the consistency. So you may lose a little bit in, in how many screens you can coat per hour, uh, but the results are going to be much better. And you're not going to be throwing as many screens. Well, not throwing away, but having to reclaim. Yeah. Yeah, how how many people. screens might an automatic coder be able to code in an hour? You're probably looking at about um, thirty to forty-five seconds to coat one set of screens. If you do, we, we normally recommend our Saudi Pro Coat, which does two screens, either twenty-three thirty-one or twenty-five thirty-six at one time, um, and it takes about. 30 to 45 seconds, depending on how many coats you put on to do that process. Well, you can still coat hundreds and hundreds of screens throughout the day. So, um, you know, that one person can, but I, again, I'm in shops now where they're developing and, and going through 50 plus screens a day. And it's not a team of operators. It's just one person going from the automatic coder to the CTS or the LTS. And then screen comes back in and that's putting in the end line. Um, it, it, and if you're a small shop, you can, the, the person can operate the coder and do the imager at the same time. Yep. They can put a set of screens in, coat them. And this, it, the machine will stop and when it's done with its process and wait for the screens to be taken out. The operator can come and take them out and do it do it afterward. Well, and Greg, I don't know if you're seeing it as much. Um, you guys at Saudi aren't really selling screen printing printing equipment. You're you're selling all of the chemicals and tools outside of being on press. We, and, we say pre-press. You know, we're we're we are experts in the pre-press area. It's getting that screen ready to print, and that's where our equipment and automation comes in. Well, and what we've seen in the industry is this new process called DTF. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's been a little bit of a industry disruptor. And what I have seen is, you know, I go to every show. And I uh, tally what equipment I see on the floor. Kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of where things are going. And DTF is by far blowing up. But I see a lot fewer manual screen presses at the shows. Um, yes. And based on my conversations, most shops who are getting into screen printing who aren't already doing it, they're going auto automatic. Um and if you go auto, I mean, it's a totally different game. That was something I didn't necessarily respect as much in my early years of how different manual screen printing is versus auto and what that output is and, you know, everything that goes behind it. You know, your, your manual, that's a lot of smaller shops, obviously, and there's nothing wrong with having a manual edition in auto, obviously, but just, again... The days of burning four screens to print 20 shirts are quickly disappearing. I mean, it just is. So, again, if you're going to have an auto, you want that thing constantly running as efficiently as possible. And one of the big things we, we've seen is the shops that have autos are now going auto pre-press uh, as well, especially if you have more than one auto that that's where I'm really seeing it. It's becoming harder and harder for me to go into a shop that has more than one auto and not see the developing process streamlined. Um, and they'll, they'll often tell you it's the best piece of equipment they bought, whether it's a LTS, a CTS, you know, the, the, it just, it is what it is, especially again, I, I kind of, it, it's the combination of, you know, the pandemic, just the work ethics is just not what it once was. 
I mean, it just, and it doesn't matter what country you're in. It just seems, you know, I talk with a lot of shops in Canada, U.S., Europe, Australia. It's just the mindset and work ethic has changed. And um, again, automation, when has it been a bad thing? Uh, it's never, never been, been bad. I mean, so you got to look at the big picture and, and how much labor is costing you, how many screens you can output. Um, versus the cost of the equipment. And before you know it, the numbers justify the purchase. So an automatic screen coder, what, what's a ballpark figure for one of those, Greg? Do you know? You're looking at, you know, used to be the old days, you know, 20 years ago, an automatic coder was 40 grand. Wow. And it was out of reach for most small shops. You're probably looking at under 20000 half that price now for the same quality of coder. And this is a coder that can do two screens at a time or one screen at a time. Um, 25 by 36 or 2331s, which are the standards. Um, and they're just, they're bulletproof. Our Saudi yep. Pro Coat, you know, I have I have customers that do 5,000 screens a day. <laughs> I'd like to tour that and, shop. And, they, and, <laughs> and, they, and they'll have four four or five coders and they run them 24 seven. Wow. Just, they just bang in screens. And, um, gosh, I can only imagine again, that shop, but so coding, it, it's probably out of the different parts. It's again, the, the least like yucky part, I would say. Um, I, I say that exposing a screen isn't yucky. Um, but there's a lot of variables to get right. And yeah. when you're start when you're doing the old school method of printing off a of film, and, and or volume and and you know sticking it to the screen, there's all types of things that can happen. So that's right. the old school method. Then, what? Yeah, tell me a little bit about when CTS came about and and how that really changed the exposure capability. You know, I mean, it's, the CTS, obviously, you know, film has become, you know, a traditional film, silver film with an image setter. Uh, you can't even buy an image setter anymore. They don't make them. Uh, if you're running one, you're buying parts off of used machines to try to keep them running. The cost of silver film is huge. Um, and then it transitioned into, say, an Epson inkjet style printer. Uh, with um, with uh, acetate film, uh, and that inkjet, the ink and the film is also expensive. Um, then you've got the positioning of that film on the screen. Uh, you, typically, they use uh, rulers and and they measure to to find the position. And they're lucky if they get it within a half an inch of from screen to screen. So there's a lot of setup time on the press because the screens aren't imaged in the same position. So computer to screen eliminates that. You're you're putting a screen in the machine. You've got a consistent position, um, and you're either spraying uh, a, a blocking fluid, uh, a liquid blocking fluid, um, inkjet style system, or you're spraying a wax onto the screen. Or now the new technologies are direct laser exposure of the screen, either with an LTS, uh, laser to screen imaging system, or a DLP um, style imaging system that uses the Texas Instrument chip um, and flashes the light onto the screen. Now you're getting extreme position in the that 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 image is on each screen in perfect position. So now it's up to the operator, the printer, to set up his press properly and his positioning on the press. Then there's almost no setup at all. You pop the screens in, you pull them all to a, a specific spot um, in the print head, lock them down, and they're almost right on. So, so you take 45-minute setup time down to five minutes. Wow. And... and um, so computer to screen was came about really to streamline the setup on the press. And it's better at holding those finer details and those half tones and so forth. 
correct? Yes, yes. Now, the, the originally, the first ones were inkjet systems where they sprayed a, a, a liquid ink onto the screen. Um, and those have some disadvantages. Uh, when you spray that ink, that pixel or that dot of ink hits the screen and it splats. Yep. So you have dot gain in that process. So the ability to hold fine details is quite difficult. Wax was a little bit of an improvement. The wax is a little thicker, and it doesn't tend to splat as much. It tends to stand up on the surface of the emulsion. So that was a little bit better. But now with the laser to screen, you're getting exact. What you, what you have on the art is being put on the screen. And when, when so did... There's no dot gain in that when, process. When did CTS come about? got to be 20 25 years ago for inkjet now laser to screen imaging system um, dlp imaging systems um, that use the texas instrument ship are probably 18 years ago something like that whoa um, and um the lts system that uh, we're selling now from saudi uh has been we've we've been selling it now for about eight years Oh, wow. Okay. So LTS has been around a little bit longer than I even realized. So CTS, though, it's kind of like phase two. Um, have those, is that equipment dropped in price over the past 25 years? Yeah. The, the, uh, so uh, you, you have, we'll give you an example. Um, if you can see it, that's a DLP, Texas Instrument DLP. Uh, imaging system and it's basically you'll see it's a mirror yep and that looks like one big mirror but there's actually a million little mirrors or a little bit more than a million little mirrors on the surface of that chip so what the cst uh, color scan there's a company in germany called color scan technology um they were the ones that started this whole using this Texas instrument chip to expose screens. And basically we use a light source to shine light onto this mirror. And then the mirrors either flash on the screen or off the screen as they scan up to create the image. And that technology has been around for quite a while, but it was very, very expensive. You're looking at $150,000, $200,000 for, um, a small machine to do a textile screen. And they're very slow. They don't expose, may take six, eight minutes to expose one, wow. one textile screen. <clears throat> then we found a technology, um, like I said, about eight years ago, which uses individual lasers on a bar, and we scan it across the screen, and the lasers turn on and off, to expose the pixels and that system started out as a horizontal unit that only you set a screen on top of it and it still had glass and the lasers were underneath the glass okay. scan back and forth and image the screen um, we realized that in large production shops that wasn't going to be efficient enough and then we're going to be able to produce enough screens so we tasked that company to produce uh, a vertical unit that would be able to expose two screens, at, two 25 by 36 screens at one time. And that's when we've come out with our vertical LTS unit, laser to screen. Um, the unit that'll do 25 by 36 screens has a, a, a laser bar, carbon fiber bar that has 128 individual lasers on it. And that unit scans back and forth and each laser does about one centimeter worth of exposure on the screen as it goes back and forth it goes across it moves up back up back up and it does that hundreds of times a minute and it scans it really quick and then the image is done. so again we went from cts to essentially lts is now the newest and greatest way to expose the best detail 
how many screens can an LTS unit like that produce? You're looking at, you know, if, if we're using a fast photopolymer emulsion, we are normally, de- you know, it depends on a, a 60 mesh screen is going to expose a lot, take a longer period of time to expose than a 305. But roughly, it's about two minutes a screen to get two minutes for a, a uh, an exposure that generates two screen. So you're looking at about okay. a minute a screen. A minute so a screen. If you're if you're exposing for two minutes each cycle, you get thirty cycles roughly in an hour. You're getting sixty screens an hour. Wow, and obviously you are telling the unit, "Hey, I'm going on this mesh or." It, it's it's obviously a little bit similar to an exposure unit as far as we need to get these variables dialed in. Is the CTS the same way? Are we telling it how much emulsion is on there, or is the CTS kind of? Yeah. So we're so we're we're when you put if you're going to expose two images two screens at a time, they both have to be the same mesh count. Okay. Because we need to, it's it's an exposure unit. Yep. It, can't, I can't expose one for a longer period of time than the other. I have they're both equal exposure. So as long as I put two 110 mesh screens in the unit, I'm exposing two of them at the same time. And we'll when when the unit is set up for the customer, we'll actually dial the exposure in with a 21 step Stouffer scale. Yep. And get a solid step six or seven uh, on the exposure. And we'll set that parameter in the software. And the operator will just click on a drop-down menu, exposure, 110 mesh, boom. And it'll that machine will automatically know what to expose those two screens. And it, it obviously, we're reducing human error um, because, I mean, there's all types of things that affect the exposure time. Obviously, yep. you know, the type of emulsion, the thickness of the emulsion, the mesh count, um, if it was stored in a humid environment, the age of the emulsion on this, the screen, there's just so many variables. But if you're automating, obviously, you're working it out. And some of those variables are easier when you're you're doing things at a higher production rate. When you're a smaller shop and you coat screens and then one of those screens has been coated and sitting there for weeks and weeks. It's not fun to expose. It's going to wash out very differently. Um, that's why I think I'm seeing more and more shops, Greg. It, What I've seen, and I don't know if you see this or agree with this, but I'm seeing more and more shops go away from screen printing in-house if they're not you know, doing it super consistently and have it automated because it's becoming where, hey, there's these mega shops, these, these big contract printers, who are willing to print at a really good price and they've got it all dialed in. They have all these Saudi tools to make everything so efficient that if I were to do it today, I would not buy screen printing equipment personally for, for my shop because I don't have the built up demand, any decoration process, I would build up the demand and justify bringing it in house. But sure. you know, it's harder. I I'm, I, it's the same thing in my shop though of, it's difficult to find the employees and keep them and, and everything else. And that's why um, I, I just see this trend more of these larger contract um, decorators um, just doing it at such a good price. And so, again, when you have the right tools, you can put out a very consistent product and it's just easier. Um, screen printing is going nowhere. It'll now nav- it'll always be the number one decoration process it's just there's no there's no screen no printing process that can lay down anywhere near the thickness of ink that screen printing can lay down lithography flexography gravure inkjet nothing can lay down as much ink and that's why you you're starting to see uh people who have have uh moved towards dtg direct to garment printing they find they have difficulty getting uh, printing on various different substrates because the it bleeds through. Um, they don't get good coverage. They don't get good uh, lengths of you know. They, after you've washed the shirt a few times, it breaks down. Screen printing can do that. 
because it's laying down such a much much thicker ink layer of ink yep and and it's the cheapest ink by far you know if you're going to do a high run one it's the fastest way to print you know any type of high run but it's also the cheapest um it every process is a time and place we're, we're seeing you we were talking previously about dtf and the entrance of dtf into the market we're seeing it heavily affecting dtg yep e, Maybe not so much. It affects screen printing because, like you said, I'm not going to print the job on a manual press. I'm going to do it with DTF or, D, you know, or DTG. But we're seeing because we can, we can. All we have to do is change the adhesive uh, that adheres that DTF print onto the shirt or the garment or the bag or whatever you're trying to stick it to. Uh, you don't have these compatibility issues with trying to stick to the garment so that DTG has. Yep. So we see it heavily affecting DTG. Yep. And, and again, it, screen printing will always be number one. It's just, and I agree, DTF is a digital process that gives, you know, DTG is what we all wanted to be kind of that solution, though. Again, hey, we got four colors on a 20 piece order i don't really want to screen print that can we dtg it and the problem it's all types of limitations and the pre-treat oh gosh nobody likes you think you think that you know developing a screen isn't fun the pre-treat is just as bad if not and and 80 percent of your problems will come down to poor pre-treat so again it's just pre-press is extremely important um and we're not even talking about the artwork part for any of these decoration process because it doesn't matter how good you do everything else. If your artwork's not good from the start or you don't have the right chokes and strokes, it, you're going to have all types of issues. But, okay, so but, developing... But as far as, you know, I, I wanted to say on automation, I'm seeing a lot of small shops that I would have never thought would look at an automatic coder and an LTS imaging system, and they're buying that because it takes the art out of the process of screen making and it becomes very much science it and does screen printing is everybody thinks oh screen printing is an art no it's not it's a science <laughs> and if we do the process correctly you get can uh, consistent repeatable results and it takes all that guesswork out of it so they're spending money that I, I'm sometimes shocked that they're willing to spend that much money on equipment just to improve that process. Well, like we said, we're improving the quality. We're speeding up production and we're essentially eliminating that worry of, well, what if so-and-so quits? If you have automation equipment and software, they will not hate the process anywhere near as much they're pushing buttons and it's not as simple as just pushing buttons no, um you know right. even even not to keep going back with digital printing but i think that's what a lot of us assume oh we just push a button no the humidity it's a water-based ink that humidity is an issue i mean it's a science and you know i remember the first time i bought um screen print chemicals and i locked up a screen because i left that um reclaim on there and i was like I learned my lesson the, the, when it says it needs to sit on there for this amount of time to respect the chemistry. I, I always like to bring up the Walter White breaking bad. You know, you have to respect <laughs> chemistry. That's it's, right. it's been around forever. Physics, chemistry. They're, they're not just made up things. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'll go into a shop and I'm always, when they're doing manual coding, I go, well, where's the five gallon bucket? And they look at me like, I said, the five gallon bucket, you put the screen on so when you hand coat, you, you can coat it. They go, oh, yeah, it's over here. And they bring it out and set it down. Like, oh. Yeah. And let's do it. Let's, let's, let's automate this and make, make it a lot more consistent. Well, and, and the next part of the automation, you know, we, we first can automate the coating, then we can automate the exposure, and then we can automate the washout. Again, it's not the worst. I always thought, oh, wait, it's kind of fun to wash out and see the stencil. It's like magic. Like, look what we made. But (laughs) it's also very much so possible to ruin that uh, screen. You know, you're you're taking a power washer or a hose, 
depending on what you're doing in your shop and you're washing out the exposed emulsion, you get too close, you start blowing it out and there's all types of issues. So um, also just, just being able just the difficulty of finding somebody to do the job. I, I always joke with people. I say, well, yeah, you hire that new person to work in the reclaim department and they work until lunchtime. And then all you see is the taillights of their car pulling out of the driveway, out of the parking lot. They don't ever come back. No. Yeah. No. And got to make and, it a little bit more enjoyable. Well, and again, these auto washout boots, you just kind of put the screen in, just goes back and forth, washes the screen out, grab it, go dry it. We're on press. So it's just one more way, um, probably one of the more cheaper automation piece of equipment is just the washout um yeah, automatic washout. Yeah, yeah simple developer yeah, absolutely um so now we've washed it out we're on press great we're, we're printing now and again we can streamline the setup of the job job runs you know good autos putting out hundreds of shirts an hour easily mm -hmm. um now comes the even more fun job, Greg. Now we got to reclaim. Now we got to get that screen back ready. And first we got to remove the ink. Then we've got to remove the emulsion. Then we've got to degrease it to get all those chemicals we just threw in there so that we're then ready back to be coating. Um, so tell us a little bit about Saudi's equipment for automating what truly is the worst part because the exposing the coating the the de developing that's actually it's not fun but it's a blast compared to reclaim and and the ink and emulsion that has to be removed and we don't always have to go with an automated piece of equipment um, many times we can take a small shop that maybe does 40 30 40 screens a day and do a manual Put a manual process in that's got a little bit of automation mixed into it. Uh, we 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 like um, a flat countersink where the sink is about waist high. The sink, the bottom, the flat part of the sink is angled back away from the operator. It goes to a rain gutter almost in the back of the washout boot, and you're setting the screen on the surface of that flat countersink, uh, you, 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 you put the screen on the flat countersink, you can scrape the ink out and pull the tape, then spray with an automated, you know, a pumping system where we have a spray gun and you spray some ink remover on the screen. Scrub it with a scrub brush, flip the screen over, brush the, the uh, image area on the backside, and then take a garden hose and water rinse the ink because we've changed that plastisol ink from plastisol into water-based with the chemistry so it can be water flushed to the drain. Water flush that ink out, spray the emulsion remover on with another gun, and slide the screen over on this flat counter sink. Then do another screen, same process, and stack them up on the sink until you get five or six screen stacks. Then you take that whole stack, flip them up, so they're now in a position to be pressure washed, and you use your pressure washer to blow out the first screen. The screen behind it's already blown out because the water went through yep. the one in front of it. And you can work down that countersink to work through the process. And that's a, not technically automation, but it's, it's streamlining the process. It sounds better than Making what I'm doing. <laughs> it sounds better than the the traditional industrial sink that that a lot of um, yeah. suppliers sell. And you know, it's yeah, just kind of a trap. Stand the screen up in. You got to. You, yep. You're scrubbing the screen, like in in the screen is losing tension as you're scrubbing it. When I'm scrubbing it on the flat stainless steel counter sink, I'm pushing against the stainless steel counter. And I'm getting much better scrubbing action, and I'm not losing the tension on that. So for small shops, we tend to go that way. Now, if you're doing 100 screens, 150 screens a day, now we start looking at automation. And I've been in this industry 40 years, 
and I've seen every automated piece of equipment that's on the market, and we've put our chemistry in every machine that's on them. <clears throat> and I found a company in Germany called Sentner Systems, and they make uh, automated washing equipment. It's industrial, it's very well engineered, um, and it's a just a fantastic system. Um, and it's it's one of the few that mimics the manual reclaiming process. So their typical machine is a speed line. It has five chambers, five modules. You load the screen on a chain. The screen goes through, slowly moves in to the first module. As soon as the screen goes into the module, that module starts spraying as a nozzle bar that goes up up and down, and it sprays the ink remover on the screen. And that cleans the ink off the screen. We actually install that piece of equipment so that it's leaning backwards. It does. It's not straight up. It's actually leaning backwards a little bit. And when you put the screen in uh, in the loading section, you're putting it in with the frame away from you and the mesh towards you. So that bottom frame rail is leaning down and the chemical drains off. It doesn't catch and get carried in yep. and you lose it. So it's a very efficient system. The second module that they have, they know there's a lot of solvent, cleaning chemical, ink remover, in on the screen as it comes out of that first module. So what they're doing is the second module is empty. It's a drip-off. And it's got a tray in the bottom of it that's angled back. The chemical drips off, hits that tray, and it goes back and drains back into the first module. So you don't lose that chemistry. Then the third module is a high-pressure water rinse. That gets all that solvent off the surface of the screen and blows off any any ink or adhesive residue that's stuck to the surface of the emulsion. Fourth module is recirculated emulsion remover. That softens the emulsion and takes the emulsion out. And then the final module is a final second high-pressure water rinse that blows everything off the screen. Then the screen comes out. And that process is mimicking exactly what you would do in a manual recall. So you get excellent results. Many of the machines that are on the market skip the water rinse between the ink remover and the emulsion remover. They don't do that. So the ink, re ink remover is still on the screen. It carries in and goes into the emulsion remover. It contaminates the emulsion remover, and then you spray the emulsion remover on it and it mixes together. That makes that emulsion remover deteriorate. And there's also a chemical reaction when you have a, a, that ink remover layer on the surface of the emulsion. Then you put the pariodate, the, the emulsion remover, on the surface of the emulsion. There's a chemical reaction. It makes the photopolymer emulsion difficult to reclaim. So by putting that water rinse in between those two, the ink remover and the emulsion remover, we make the process much more efficient. So we get very good results. I'm looking at, when I'm running a speed line, I want to get 90 to 95% of the screens that come out of the end usable. They can go right to coating. There'll only be a couple of screens that maybe need a little pressure wash. If you eliminate that that water rinse process, then we're probably at sixty to seventy percent of the screens that come out of the end of the machine are using. Yeah, and I've seen there's different, you know, you know, you say the chambers and how that works. I've seen some manufacturers have three, some have five. Obviously, when you see less, they're skipping a step or they're kind of merging two. The other thing I've seen that made me kind of scratch my head were some of them have these brushes um, just like we're going to be hitting the mesh. And I'm like, 
doesn't that just get coated with emulsion and ink and then just put it on the next screen? Like, it doesn't make sense to me why you'd want that brush there. And then the emulsion is stuck to the brushes and it dries overnight and gets hard. And then it actually cuts the cuts. mesh or breaks the mesh as it's going through. No, it's the Zetner is a no brush system. Yep. We, we don't want to use any brushes on the screen. Which, yeah. So anybody out there looking for, you know, an inline to reclaim, I, I just based on what I've seen at the shows, the brushes, I try to avoid those because um, yep. it's it just all types of bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. um, so what what is an inline uh, five chamber machine running these days, Greg? You're you're looking at about a hundred and twenty thousand US uh, for that that machine. Uh, that's going to have the potential to do um, uh, about four hundred four to five hundred screens in an eight hour shift. Um, now we do Zentner does make uh, a compact, which is a three module system, and it eliminates that water rinse. So we, we've had to come out with a machine that was competitive with other machines that are on the market. I don't normally recommend them, but if you run them slow, the transport speed, the chemical will drip it's, off okay. better, and it won't contaminate the emulsion as much. And you're looking at about 75, 70 to 75 for one of those machines. And that's a three-module system. And you're probably going to be able to get 250 screens in an eight-hour shift. Wow. And have you seen a big increase in the demand in the past handful of years since, Huge. like, COVID again? Like Huge. You, um, before COVID, um, we very seldom, there was not anywhere as near as many sh machines being sold in the marketplace. Since COVID, it's just been a huge boom. Mainly because of the labor situation, you uh, just can't. You can't. You, labor is twice as expensive as it used to be, or well, more. Well, yeah, we didn't and, even tuck on the fact that it's more expensive. It's just the fact that you can't get anybody to do it. And then, yeah, but, but now, it's, yeah, it's more. And I think the cost is not as much a complaint. Is they just can't get anybody to do the job. Yep, I would. Yeah. And if in if I can take. Uh, maybe a reclaim department that had two people or three people in it and take it down to one that pays for it that pays for that yeah. hundred thousand dollar machine over an roi is is reasonable for any shop that absolutely again if if i um when i go into a shop with more than one auto i i almost see everything automated now um especially when you're like california and, and everything i mean just the cost is, is so high. Um, and then we also have, we have, you know, we have to consider the environmental reasons. Um, it, when we're using an automated piece of equipment, we're recirculating the emulsion remover. We're recirculating the ink remover. Um, we Now you can collect that and have that disposed of by a hazardous waste handler or an industrial waste handler. <clears throat> You've got the documentation uh, to prove it, and there's less hassle with the sewer department and EPA and OSHA and everybody. So it's it's a much cleaner, more consistent document, documentable process uh, to do it. And again, because it's we're using you know technology, we're eliminating that human error of potentially hurting the mesh and the screen when you reclaim and you're struggling to get that that image out or, or that emulsion out before you know it you're taking that power washer too close to the mesh you're creating problems you're hurting the tension you know before you know it, you're destroying your screen tension it doesn't matter oh look i gotta clean yeah well when you go to register on press it's gonna be baggy and you're gonna have all types of problems um and if we and if we do the process properly, <clears throat> we I call it ink management. <clears throat> if we train the printers that are working with the screen and putting the ink in the screen to control how much ink they're putting in the screen, <clears throat> and then when they take the ink out, how they're taking it out, 
So many times I see them, they use the card or the scraper and they scrape it right up the side of the inside of the frame rim. <laughs> That's almost impossible to clean with an automated yep. machine. You, if you take two cards and scoop it out and put it in the bucket to get it out, we don't we eliminate that problem. So I call that ink management. You don't print with the frame, it shouldn't have any ink on it. Only yep. the mesh should yep. have the ink on it. Either <laughs> the mesh and the emulsion. Wherever you don't print, shouldn't have ink on it. If we control that, and then we stay away from aerosol screen openers, rocket fuel in a can. Um, my, my joke is always, uh, you have to keep a can of that, you know, that rocket fuel around. Uh, so when things are a little slow, you take a brown paper bag, you squirt the stuff in there, it makes the day go by much faster. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, it's like... Don't put it on the screen. Yeah. Don't oh, put it on the screen. It's... And because the, what's happening is those solvents, xylol, lacquer thinner, aerosol screen openers, are causing an ink stain in the screen that we can't get out with the normal cleaning process, with the environmentally friendly cl screen cleaning chemical. Then we have to use a haze remover. Yep. And there's no need to do that. If you if you may use an environmentally friendly press wash and open the screen up with that then it will reclaim without any stain and and you know it, it's funny screen opener and haze remover those are two by far the most toxic you know chemicals yeah you'll you'll find in the shop you got to use the right chem hey there's a difference between ink remover and press wash that's why one is pw2 pw4 ir26 er2 you know, it, and use when it says dilute it to this extent, I mean, again, it's chemistry. You've got to follow the instructions properly. Um, it's all science. Know, as, as, as I look at this industry, somebody who's been in it for 40 years, my first 20 years, our largest selling product was Hazer. <laughs> because they oh, used lacquer thinner, they used MEK, they used toluene, acetone, and the only way you could get the stain out of the screen was with a hazer. Today, our lowest volume chemical that we sell is hazer. Wow. We almost all of, we very, especially in a t shirt shop, never need hazer. We and, can get the stains out and control the ink stain with proper ink management and chemistry usage in the shop. And the haze remover I've used from Saudi when I needed to was the HR6, which yeah, is HR6. not in the same world as oh, your average haze a, remover. That's not technically a I, Yeah, I would dig it. Based yeah. Haze yeah. Um, Something I'm now seeing more Greg at shows is automating the squeegees and flood bars now. You know, I, I, I'm starting to see that a lot more often. Again, one more, it, cleaning a screen isn't fun. Why would a squeegee and flood bar be any more fun? So are you seeing that become uh, more popular? Yes, much more popular. So we'll do, um, if it's a small shop um, and they don't want to, to buy an actual piece of equipment, um, we'll use a process, um, a water process to clean the squeegees. So we'll take, um, I call it busboy tray. Uh, it's the little black or gray plastic um, containers that a busboy at a restaurant would carry okay, around yep, to put yep. plates in. So it's maybe eight or ten inches deep, uh, about the size, you know, one foot wide, two feet long. Yep. And we'll put a mixture of ink remover and water in that tray. Then we take the squeegee that we've scraped the ink off of the best that we can, and we just dip it in that tray. We don't clean it in the tray. Yep. We just dip it in. The dipping is the application method. Then we set it on this flat counter sink and scrub it with a scrub brush. Then water rinse it off with a garden hose. So that's for the small shop. But a bigger shop, we do we put that ink remover inside an automated uh, squeegee washing uh, machine where you'll have a basket inside 
the unit. You'll set the squeegees in the basket. Uh, we quite often use a um, a glass. It's it's actually a plastic um, container that's used to that they use in the restaurant to put glasses in, and they put them in the dishwasher. Okay. Yep. At the, at the, at a restaurant, they have little little um, little spikes sticking up yep. in them, and you can set the squeegees and flood bars in there. It stands them straight up. Then this squeegee washer basket will spin around and spray the chemistry on it, and cl- and it'll clean the clean the squeegee. Then you take them out. And all you do is water rinse it off. Again, just one less thing to have to one less dirty job that could be automated. Um, so, Greg, outside of coating, exposure, washout, reclaim, cleaning squeegees and um, uh, flood bars. Is there anything else that you're really seeing, you know, being automated um, through equipment, you know, chemicals, or just general procedures? Yeah, just, it, I don't know whether you mentioned development, but yes, obviously development. But uh, no, I think that's that's about it at this point. Uh, there aren't may, very many other processes to, that you can. Uh, nothing else that you can automate in the in the process. And and like we said, it, it's. It's about consistency, speed, um, not worrying again if the employee's going to show up to work on Monday. The, the joke is, I know the equipment is, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And the equipment's going to work the same yep. way every day. Yeah. And and let's say that that employee who does run it is out that day. It's not as big of a deal to grab somebody else to, to do it for the day. Um, any other type of technology that, that you see coming down the road? Again, L- Laser to screen definitely was a pretty big one. Um, it, even the suppliers I talked to in the industry that only do CTS, they're like, Saudi figured out this LTS pretty quickly, and we're, we're kind of behind because it is the future um, of exposure. Yeah, I mean, there, we, we are constantly upgrading uh, the LTS um, software in the system. Um, we, when we first started with this LTS system, um, you know, it had, a, it had a good file management system, but we've made it much easier and more user friendly, um, uh, to use. Uh, we've now built into that system, um, some, some ability for the screen maker the, in the screen department to modify the artwork um, to get a better result on the screen. So let's say we've got an image that has super fine lines or little tiny register marks. And when you go to wash the screen out, it won't, it won't wash out. Well, in the past, that, art, that screen maker would have to go to the art department and say, hey, can you, put, can you open this area of that file up and send it back to me so I can re, re, I can make it. Now we have a process we call line refine and where we can widen the line or shrink the oh, line that's cool. right on the LTS without modifying the art. So we'll, normally what happens is um, the art department's pretty consistent with the art that they're producing and when you look at the results of the what the emulsion can hold and what the printing press can print, um, we know how much we have to fatten or thin the line to get the correct result on the press. So we'll actually build that build a profile for that customer that when they run line work, they should use this amount of line refine in the process and we get good results. Um, the other thing that we use that for is um, we've had a bunch of customers that we've sold an LTS imaging system to and they call us up a week later and they say, we got a real problem. Okay, what's the real problem? It The stuff that we're getting off the LTS looks too good. What? It's it's beautiful, but we sell stock art shirts. 
to our customers. If we send the new stuff to them, those customers will want to return the old stuff because it doesn't look as good. Can you make the LTS produce the same bad quality prints oh that we got before? Yes, we can. And we'll, so we'll modify the, the profile, the, the, the line refine, and give them two different old work and new work. <laughs> what a problem to have. Yeah. It's too uh, good. We had, we had a couple of customers that, that almost returned units until we went to the manufacturer and <laughs> built this into the system. <laughs> and the other thing that we're doing um, that I don't think anybody else is doing is we're actually doing a linearization. When we do an install of an LTS machine, we come in and have you print, let's say you print 55 line half done. We'll, have, we'll give you a file, and you actually generate it, run it through your RIP software, and produce that image file. And what it'll have is it'll have little one-inch squares of 0% to 100% dots. And we'll have you actually print that. And then we'll adjust the RIP to give you dots so that when you want a 5% dot, you get a 5%. If you want a 95% dot, you get a 95%. 50, you get a 50. Normal process, normal co- to computer to screen machines, equipment, you don't get that. You're probably getting a 5% dot in the 12% dot, where a 12% dot so, should yep. be. Because you're getting dot loss and dot gain in the process. So we'll actually come in and do that linearization for the customer. So they're their simulated process and their process work looks much, much better. Um, well, again, Greg, where can one of our viewers learn more about, you know, Saudi's equipment, products, um, and how to automate, again, the uh, pre-press uh, operations of screen printing? Yeah, just contact us, you know, either through one of our distributors or if um, if you don't have a distributor you're in your area, you can uh, contact one of our um, reps and they'll actually come and visit you and, and actually talk to you about what which machine is the right machine for you and what, what the features and benefits are that are best for you. Um, there are There is some literature we can send you. Uh, a brochure. There's also quite a few um, videos on YouTube. Yeah, we we've Saudi. made several with Saudi, almost on yeah. all these different pieces of equipment. Because yeah, you can see it, and we've done. And most we're really concentrating not on it. We have videos that we've produced by Saudi, but I think the testimonials are better. The yep. customers who bought it who have no affiliation with us. And they're saying, look, this is, I, we put this machine in, and it's been the best thing that we've ever done. Yep. That's, that's the best testimonial. Better than us saying, oh, look at how great our machine is. Yep. Uh, I, it's funny. When I tour these shops, like the favorite piece of equipment, check out this. Yeah. This, is, this has been the game changer, and it's not the press. <laughs> it's, it's the, the pre-press stuff, um, especially when it comes to the reclaim. Well, thank you, Greg, so much for joining us today. Um, again, I'm a Saudi guy. I um, use all Saudi chemicals um, when it comes to getting screens ready. Um, have used Scotty or Saudi mesh uh, to stretch with Saudi. Just anybody out there? Not I. I hated even. I kind of played with it stretching. Um, Saudi has a really nice uh, stretching equipment. It works a little bit differently. Don't really have time to talk about that, but yeah, we can't, you know, we so, don't want to talk about it yeah. today. But we have to remember that our core, our core business is mesh. And yeah, we are experts. We have the our, our we have about 500 looms in Italy and uh, probably another 50 to 75 looms in France, and uh, we produce all the mesh that we sell worldwide to the screen printing market is produced in Europe, um, and We've got some new technology, the height, we call it hydro uh, mesh, where it's a thin thread mesh 
uh, that is not brittle and will hold up much better than traditional thin thread mesh that you see in the marketplace. So that it's not as fragile. It, it holds up to abuse. Um, and the name says hydro, and it probably is the most beneficial in water-based printing, but it's unbelievably also available for plastic. Plastic. I mean, I <clears throat> I introduced it to the printers in Central America probably six or eight years ago, and they pretty much everybody uses it in Central America, um, and they're printing underbase whites and underbases with 160 or 198 mesh. What? Rather than 110. What? Because they get they they get much better brighter colored white ink. Wow. And much better because you've got a full surface. Can I talk about it a little bit? Or yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Time. So you, if you think about a mesh, um, if you if the mesh is thick, and we pull the squeegee across it, as that mesh lifts off and pulls away, there's a, a void where the mesh was. And the plastisol ink, or whatever ink, has to flow and fill that void. If the mesh is thinner, there's less of a void and better chance that it'll seal. So if if I take a print that's white ink on a black shirt, one hit, and I run a 110 uh, mesh compared to a 160 hydro, the 160 hydro will look like there's more ink. Wow. It looks more opaque. It's brighter white. But I used about half as much ink. Which means it I probably has a better hand as well. Yeah, and it's a softer hand. So it's it's unbelievable. And how new is that technology? How old is it? Yeah. Oh. It was introduced... Um, to the screen, pr- the textile screen printers, um, with a product on the market called S Mesh, uh, probably about eight or nine years ago, something okay. like that. Um, and we saw the the customers complaining because the mesh was breaking. I mean, they would print it, just wouldn't even get to the press, and the screens would break. So. We had requests from customers, can you make a similar mesh? And it's right in our wheelhouse. We can absolutely yep. make that. So we, we, made, we made a series of mesh um, that were the basics, made about five, five different meshes, 110, you know, 120, 140, 160s. And now we've probably got 12 or 14 mesh, uh, different wow. mesh counts. Um, and we'll and so we're covering the full range, um, and we've it's been on the market at least six years, something like that. Um, but it takes a while for the word to get out about it. But people who are using it absolutely, and it pays for itself just in the in the reduction of ink that you use. But yeah, I mean, the ink is expensive. If you, I can reduce your ink usage by twenty or forty percent. Well, you're also reducing the amount of screens because maybe I don't need two screens now to do that white. And you're on a higher mesh count, which means you're getting better detail. Um, So, again, if I have some white in there that's real small and I have the base, sometimes i got to do two separate screens. Hey, it's just... I was at a printer in China, and I won't name them. Uh, They were printing a black shirt with a white nike swoosh they print water-based ink and they had eight screens to print wow two bleed blockers and six whites in order to get an opaque print i said i looked at it i I walked through the printing department i said what in the world are you doing and they said oh we have to do that in order to because our ink is so cheap we have to do that in order to get the number of prints. I said, I can do it with three. 
And they said, no way. So I said, yeah, we're going to do one bleed blocker and two whites. We, I, made, I, I, I made screens with hydro mesh, and I was a brighter white shirt on that black garment with three screens compared to their eight. Using, using the same ink? Same ink. Wow. Wow. Again, it's chemistry. There's a lot that goes into it. When you're first getting started, you just think, oh, it's ink on a shirt. <laughs> no. no. There's a lot that it's goes into it. We get back to it's science. If yep. we reduce the size of the thread, the, 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 the ink doesn't have to flow as far, and we get a better result. It sounds like Saudi's always innovating, looking to you know we, we, make it better. We have cut our teeth. Uh, we're we're our our owner of our company um, is um, one hundred percent committed to screen printing. And his in his words, we will be the last man standing <laughs> because we're it's it's in our blood, and we're we're committed to screen printing, and we've been successful at. It. Other people are, yep. you know, it's dec- they think the industry is declining. Uh, we don't see that decline. Yes, there's less screen printing going on, but we're able to capture more customers because we're having a better product. Hey, you get what you pay for, but in my experience, Saudi isn't more expensive either. Um, I went when my screen printer came into my shop and was like, I don't want to use this stuff anymore. I want to use this. And then, oh, yeah, I, I started seeing a lot of uh, improvements. Um, well, thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. Um, I look forward to uh, stopping at the Saudi booth at the next couple trade shows. You guys always have um, great equipment and um, have the guys there to really share uh, this information. Um, and, again, I think um, the shops that are really trying to um, – evolve with screen printing again automation automation in any decoration process at any part of that process the better um i look at it as manual screen printing versus automatic it's night and day difference when you can automate you know the the pre-press stuff it it really changes your perception on what is possible um and, and what is and is not fun um so thank you so much again, Greg, for joining us and uh, look forward to doing great, this again. Great. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.